A very good morning. Good morning. Am I, am I uh, audible? Yes, good. It's great to be with you. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and join you here in Sheffield. Let's see if we can get these slides going. There we go. Um, my first time in, uh, in this city, so uh, it's, it's a really great reason to be here to join you for this special day. And I do hope that uh, we get the chance to talk uh, during lunch and, uh, and also talk to each other about some of the issues that we're going to be hearing during the course of this morning. Um, I uh, have been hosting a, a radio show, as Bishop Pete said. I'm just going to put my timer here, make sure I'm, I'm on time. Uh, I've been hosting a radio show called Unbelievable for about 12 years now. It broadcasts on Premier Christian Radio. Uh, anybody heard of Premier Christian Radio here? Show of hands. Good. Anyone actually ever listen to Premier Christian Radio? <laughs> a few. Good. All right. We do, we do extend uh, up here uh, via the wonders of digital radio. You can tune in in Sheffield and the surrounding areas. But um, really, the show exists as a place for Christians and non-Christians to get together to dialogue and discuss. And recently, I've adopted a strap line for the radio show, which is uh, creating conversations that matter. Because I think we've, we've in many ways lost the art of good conversations in our society today. Uh, we are all aware of the way that I think social media, as much as it provides great benefits and the online discussion pages that we can have uh, are really good ways of connecting with people, it can also create echo chambers in a way so that the people with certain political views only ever tend to hear from people who think like them. In fact, it's been shown that people like Google and Facebook actually learn your particular habits and your ways of thinking and they create algorithms that make sure that you only get fed the kinds of views and stories that you enjoy reading about. So in a way, the, uh, the information superhighway was meant to connect us to all people everywhere. Uh, sadly, it, it often actually only connects us to people who share the same opinions as us. And, and I think that's a shame because it means that very often when we do, especially online, have two people who have a different point of view, it gets, it gets quite ugly quite quickly very often. And I found that bringing people together face to face makes an enormous difference, that conversations really do matter in terms of helping us to understand each other and our different perspectives. So I started at Premier Christian Radio um, at the beginning of my radio broadcasting career helping with the uh, morning breakfast show. And one of the jobs I had there was to host or help to host the phone-in. So it was my job to find a suitable topic of conversation uh, that we would uh, get, the, get the listeners ringing in. Uh, I was listening to, uh, is it... Uh, Radio Hallam uh, on just this morning and uh, their, their phoning conversation was on whether it was okay for parents to charge for children to come to birthday parties um, which got them ringing in uh, and uh, is something that as a parent myself I'm, I have a few opinions on but it was finding that sort of talking point that was the, the important thing because if it went well you'd have a, phone, a, a computer screen lit up with phone calls it would fly by if it, if, it, if it was a subject which didn't really interest people, people weren't bothered about phoning in for, then it was a, the, the radio equivalent of treading water as you tried to fill time. But uh, that really um, helped me to understand that often the thing that makes people engage with a subject is hearing an opinion that they don't necessarily agree with. And that was the premise of the show that I suggested to the senior management at Premier Christian Radio 12 years ago. I said, I want to start a radio show where we bring non-Christians into studio because Premier Christian Radio is great at talking to Christians about Christian things, resourcing the Christian community, but I don't think we're very good at reaching beyond that bubble. And I think it's important for people who listen to our station to have good conversations modelled for them so that they're ready to inter interact with their friends and neighbours and colleagues because, frankly, that's where most of their life happens. It doesn't happen inside the walls of church. It happens out in the community. And so uh, it was given the green light. And uh, every Saturday since then, for about an hour and a half, I've had my own slot. We call it unbelievable with a question mark. And the question mark is important because it's really about uh, looking at a question each, each week. Uh, there's a picture of myself in studio there. And... Um, the idea of the show 
is that I sit down with someone who is and isn't a Christian. I try and host that debate in a sort of neutral way. Uh, it could be a discussion on the evidence for God, the reliability of scripture, ethics, philosophy, history, science and faith, all kinds of things that we cover on the show from week to week. Uh, this uh, picture here is uh, a recent show we had. Uh, the gentleman nearest to the screen is, uh, is Andrew Copson. Funnily enough, I actually went to university with him, but we went in quite different directions after that because he's now head of Humanists UK. And you may be familiar with them. They were, until recently, the British Humanist Association and essentially advocating for non-religious people in the UK, resourcing them, um, you know, speaking out against what they regard as church privilege and that sort of thing. And, uh, and so humanism is the, the worldview that Andrew represents, a non-religious approach to life, believing that we can be perfectly good moral people without having to have any reference to religion or God. And, uh, and the uh, gentleman opposite him in the orange jumper is Theo Hobson, who's a, a writer and theologian. And he had recently published a book rather cheekily titled God Created Humanism. Uh, and so <laughs> their debate was on whether... The humanism that Andrew espouses is in some way actually dependent on the Judeo-Christian worldview out of which it came. So that was a really good conversation. Those are the kinds of reasonably intellectual, highbrow discussions in some ways that we do, but we try and make sure that they're accessible, that uh, the average radio listener can enjoy them. And over the years, uh, one of the great things about the show is that it's really taken off as a podcast. So people listening now all over the world... Uh, via their iPhone or tablet or computer. And uh, what that's meant is we've actually drawn in a great deal of non-Christians as well as Christians who listen to the program. And I'll tell the story of that a little later on as well. So that's the, the way the show works. And, and really, all that we're aiming to do is have an honest, open conversation on faith. And in the process of doing that, we've been engaging in something that to give it its technical term, is apologetics. Uh, and it's not to do with apologizing for anything. It's really about making the case for Christianity from argument and evidence. And in, by doing it in this conversational way, it's been a really helpful way of helping people to see that Christian faith can stand on its own two feet, that we don't throw our brains in the dustbin when we become a Christian, and that actually um, there's a great deal that we can draw upon in our history in uh, our intellectual streams of thought to help us to make the case for Christianity. And, um, and it's really been really important in helping us to, to engage with those major objections that have existed for thousands of years and continue to exist today to Christian faith. But uh, I've got a little question I wanted to ask you as we begin this morning. So this is your chance to get to know your neighbour. As, we, uh, as I, I want you, to, just for a couple of minutes, to talk in twos or threes about these two questions. Firstly... Do you ever get asked to explain your faith by people who are not Christians? And secondly, if so, how would you sum up your faith in 90 seconds? Okay. So if you would, just for a couple of minutes, start talking to your neighbor to your left and right and see what you come up with. The question is, the first question really is, is whether I suppose we're, we're, if we're not getting asked um, by people... Why, why we are, who we are, what, what we believe in. I suppose the question to ask ourselves is, is why not? Um, and I think, that, to be honest, half the Christian life is about living a life that provokes those kinds of questions. Uh, and then, of course, being prepared if those questions do come to say something in response. In fact, um, we had a recent uh, radio interview, we call it the profile, where we sit down with someone and have a bit of a long-form chat about their life and faith and ministry and we did it recently with a young evangelist called Glenn Scrivener, who I think is actually ordained in the Church of England. And at one, at one point, the interviewer asked him to sum up Christian faith in 90 seconds. And, and he did so. And he, he, it was quite interesting the way he did it. And we put it on our Facebook page. And it went fairly viral. Well, in our terms, viral at least. It had over 500,000 views within a few days. So, um, so this is what Glenn said in response to that second question. 
In the beginning, there was light and life and love. There was a father loving his son in the joy of the Holy Spirit. And everything has come from light and life and love. And out of this has come a world that is destined to share in light and life and love. But you know that this world is not like that. I know this world is not like that. I look around and I see darkness and death and disconnection. Where's that come from? Well, we've turned from the light. And when you turn from the light, where else do you go but darkness? And when you turn from love, where else do you go but disconnection? When you turn from life, where else do you go but death? So so this is the kind of world we live in. But what does, what does love do when love sees the beloved in trouble? Love says, your pit will be my pit. Your plight will be my plight. Your debts will be my debts. Your darkness will be my darkness. Your death will be my death. So who is Jesus? Jesus is love come down. The son of the father comes and, and becomes our brother. To be with us in the darkness, to take that darkness on himself on the cross, to take that disconnection on himself, to even to take that death that we all deserve for turning from God, took that on himself on the cross, plunged it down into the hell that it deserves, and he rose up again to light and life and love, and he says, you in the darkness, do you want my light? You in death, do you want my life? You in disconnection, do you want my love? And anyone who simply says yes to Jesus, we get Jesus in our life. We get his father as our father. We get his spirit as our spirit. We get his future as our future. It's for free and it's forever. So do you want Jesus? So uh, now, now obviously Glenn, Glenn has thought about that. He's, he's put some thought into what he would say. And, uh, and I think that's worth doing. And in fact... Um, there's, there's a fairly well-known verse in Scripture. It's the sort of the go-to verse for any, anyone who calls themselves an apologist. And, and that is the verse from 1 Peter 3.15. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Oh, in fact, before we go there, a bit of, bit of a, um, publicity for, for the bookstall. Um, I want to make sure that you're aware that Phil at CLC Books uh, is over here just, just around the side of this pillar... And he's got some great titles. Uh, if you don't want to go a bit deeper with any of these issues that we're talking about this morning, um, these are a few of my personal recommendations, books that I found really helpful. Um, a classic, of course, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. I'm sure many of you will have come across that before um, in terms of his, his case, really, for, for faith, for the Christian faith, that really still stands up remarkably well some 70 or 80 years after he wrote it. Uh, a more recent publication, The Atheist Who Didn't Exist by Andy Bannister. I really enjoyed this book. It's, uh, it's very funny, uh, but it's all about the consequences of a strictly atheistic worldview and asking, can we ground a lot of the things we believe about life uh, on that worldview? I know that that's also available from the bookstall. Reunion by Bruxy Cavey. Now, this one isn't actually available, but Bruxy is a pastor out in Canada. Um, he's a friend of mine, and This is a really accessible book for uh, people who perhaps are new to faith or or aren't interested even in organized religion, explaining in a very accessible way the gospel. Uh, So that's another one to potentially look out for. And a few more if you want to take it a bit deeper. Uh, Confident Christianity by Chris Sinkinson. Tim Keller has some great books. His latest is Making Sense of God. Uh, That's really aimed at people who want some kind of a a foundation for even beginning to countenance the idea of God, really. Uh, And uh, a a good book when it comes to suffering is Why by Sharon Dirks, looking at God, evil, and personal suffering. Again, at least a couple of those titles available uh, at the bookstall. And uh, if you want to go really deep into some more academic stuff, um, again, I've put a few suggestions there. I don't think these are actually available here, but um, some of those books uh, on... The um, Reliability of Scripture, Richard Borkham's book was really a watershed in biblical scholarship, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, uh, making the case for the Gospels as eyewitness testimony. Um, Mike Lacona is one of the foremost scholars in the world looking at the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, there's a great book called A Fortunate Universe, recently published between a Christian and agnostic cosmologist, uh, looking at the case for whether the universe itself is evidence for the existence of God. So... um, So those are some of my recommendations. Um, And finally, if I might uh, be so bold as to give a a little plug for my own book, which is is also available from the bookstall and really tells the story of the show and my case for Christian faith after 10 years of hearing objections from some of the world's leading atheists. And I'd be very happy to sign any copies that do get purchased today. Uh, So, um, But this is the the verse I was uh, teeing us up for. 
1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. And I don't know what your Christian journey was, but mine was one where I was brought up in a Christian family, uh, and church going was just part of life, as it is for many young people growing up in that environment. But Christian faith only really came alive for me around the age of 15 on a youth retreat when I had what I would describe as an experience of the Holy Spirit, which really set my faith on fire in many ways. And, And from that point on, it became my own. It wasn't simply something inherited from my parents. And when I went back to school and told my school friends in sixth form, you know, look, I've had this amazing experience and I want to tell you about it. They were were interested, but a little bit quizzical and sceptical. And they said, well, that's great for you, Justin, but I, I haven't had your experience, so I'm not sure it's terribly relevant to me. And as I went to university and, and got on in life, similar experiences. It's one thing to have an experience, but it's quite hard to make someone else sort of experience that for themselves, you know, that they're, they're not going to have the same experience you've had. And it was very often at that point that I, I came across this thing we call apologetics. The idea that it, as well as having subjective personal experiences that tell us about the Christian faith, that, that if you like we can base our, our faith upon, there are also certain objective uh, evidences that we can put, put forward to anyone, if you like, that, that are open to everyone to investigate and look at. And that's very often, if you've got to the point where you've shared your own story and perhaps the reasons for faith that come from a personal angle with someone, and they're, they're just not convinced, then there can be a, a useful way into that conversation by actually looking at some of the things that are available to us all in terms of the, the way the universe works, the way that we think about life, that might help us to ask, does Christianity make sense? Is it a valid intellectual option for the average thinking person? And that's very much, I think, what 1 Peter 3.15 is talking about. Not only our own personal reasons for why we believe, but also some of those reasons that we can point people to which, which are all around us. And, um, and apologetics uh, is really what St. Paul was doing as well uh, in Athens. I think Bishop Pete is going to be talking about that this afternoon. But really, um, the problem with apologetics is very often it's been, it's been sort of left in the ivory towers of academia and very often the average person doesn't feel that they can access these sorts of intellectual arguments and so on. And so in the course of doing the radio show, I've tried to put these kinds of issues out into the public sphere, make them accessible through these kinds of everyday conversations that we try to inspire on the programme. And along the the way, I've, I've learned a great deal, not just in the area of apologetics, but also in terms of theology. Um, The show doesn't just exist to have these Christian, non-Christian discussions and debates, but we often have Christians of different types coming on to debate issues on the theological spectrum. Uh, We've been uh, privileged to have a number of quite high-profile, both atheists and Christians on the show in that respect. Um, Some of the most high-profile Christians I've had on have actually been from the USA, perhaps when they've been uh, in London uh, promoting a book or whatever it might be. Uh, There was uh, a very interesting show I did with this gentleman, Rob Bell. I don't know if anyone's heard of of Rob Bell, but he's uh, he's been well known uh, around the world, really, for uh, his books, his videos. Uh, He led a large church out in Michigan in the USA for quite some time. Uh, But he came into the studio in 2011 um, while he was publicizing a book called Love Wins. And that was somewhat controversial at the time uh, among evangelical circles because He appeared to be defending a form of universalism, the idea that everyone will ultimately be saved. So I brought him in to have a debate with a more conservative theologian on that. The show was extremely popular and brought the show to a whole new audience, really, because of the number of people who shared about it and were blogging about it and so on. So we do do those kinds of inter-theological debates. Equally, um, I have people on the more conservative end of the spectrum. This is another well-known character in the U.S. church, Mark Driscoll, who, uh, whose form of sort of quite masculine, almost alpha male Christian preaching uh, earned him a bit of a reputation. And uh, you, can, well, you can read the story of what happened to his church uh, if, you, uh, if you just look him up. But Mark Driscoll, uh, this was an interesting one because on the occasion that I did interview him for the show, uh, he actually turned the tables on me and started grilling me on my theological credentials. So uh, when that finally went to air... Uh, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of interest in that because of that. And, uh, and again, uh, 
interestingly, that became the most downloaded show that I'd ever put out. I ne never even intended it to be an, uh, uh, an edition of the radio show, but uh, in the end, it, we put it out, and, uh, and it's been interesting to have those theological conversations along the way. But by and large, I've tried to keep the main thing, the, the sort of uh, discussion between secular culture and the Christian church. And part of that is because around the show launched was the time that the, the new atheism really was beginning to reach its zenith. The new atheism is a, a form of sort of very anti-religious sentiment among certain public intellectuals who say that Christianity is not only wrong, but evil even. And it's very often been led by Richard Dawkins, who's well known uh, in the past as a biologist, now more well known really as one of the mo world's most famous atheists. And around the time the show began, he published The God Delusion, his book setting out his case against God. And that's produced an enormous amount of material and content and discussion for the show. So in many ways, I, I thank God for Richard Dawkins because he, he has been an extraordinary um, figure to, to gather around and, and for conversation and dialogue. And I have had the opportunity to speak to him a couple of times as well in the course of the program. And um, I knew that the show wouldn't be everyone's cup of tea because, as I say, unbelievable, it took our Christian listeners outside of the Christian bubble. But many found it to be worth the risk because, at the end of the day, bubbles are made for popping, aren't they? And we live in this internet age where both believers and non-Christians are only a Google search away from radical skepticism about Christianity. In fact, these days, if you type in the word Jesus... To, or history of Jesus or something to Google, you're just as likely to get 10 sites claiming that he didn't exist as you are to some proper biblical scholarship on the subject. And so we live in this age where I think it's, it's uh, both easier than ever to access information, but harder than ever to access really good information because there's so much out there. And um, the amazing thing, in a sense, about uh, the show was that by helping Christians to hear from some of the best objections out there to Christian faith. In the process, we also brought in a lot of non-Christians, because as I say, the show started to be broadcast as a podcast as well as the, the weekly radio show. And as that began to be shared among the sceptical community, uh, we quickly found that we were picking up a lot of non-Christian listeners as well, not just here in the UK, but especially in North America and Canada, Australia and other parts of the world. And so it's delightful really now, uh, 10 or 12 years on, to have so many uh, emails coming in each, each week after the show is broadcast, not just from Christians, but from many non-Christians who enjoy listening to the show. And the reason they often give is that they feel that it does provide a genuinely open forum for these kinds of discussions, that it's not all weighted in favour of the Christian or, or equally in favour of the atheist. There's a, there's a genuinely kind of open questioning dialogue forum to be able to hear be the, the best sides of both, both sides in that sense. And uh, very often one of the comments that will be made by a non-Christian is, you wouldn't normally catch me listening to Christian radio, but uh, your show is the exception, which I take as, as a, a great uh, commendation for the show. So um, my journey on the show has really involved having this sort of 10-year course in theology and apologetics. And at the 10-year sort of marker of the show, I invited listeners to send in their questions for me, and I would try to answer as many Myself, because most of the time it's really just me, me facilitating the conversation between the, the Christian guest and the non-Christian guest. But on this occasion I said I'd try and answer as many questions from my perspective as possible. And one of the most common questions was simply, why, after all these years of hearing some of the best objections to Christianity and faith, why are you still a Christian, Justin? And that was really where the book came from in the end. I thought that was a good reason to, to write a book, to kind of put my perspective on things. Certainly there's been lots of mystery, lots of unanswered questions, lots of things filed under, I simply don't know, or ask me on the other side of eternity or something. But at the same time, I found that actually engaging in these, the, these discussions and debates has actually strengthened my faith. It hasn't weakened it or... Um, or, or, or caused it to crumble. I think there's lots of things that you do ultimately have to reassess and fine-tune and, and think about. Uh, certainly my faith is not exactly the same one that I had when I had that experience as a 15-year-old. But nonetheless, I found that in the course of hearing from both sides, uh, it's tempered my faith. It's, it's turned what was probably a somewhat brittle faith initially into something a lot tougher and a lot more confident 
to go out into the world with. And I hope that the same effect occurs for Christians who listen. And I hope that for the non-Christians who listen, even if they're not converted by what they hear, they certainly won't be able to listen to several episodes and go away thinking, well, those Christians, they just believe in fairy tales and superstition. I think what they will hear is a genuinely thought-through, uh, intellectually rigorous defense of Christianity. And very much it's, it's left open to them as to what they do with it after that. Um, so what I've tried to do in the book is, is lay some of my cards on the table and give something of a, a reason, a few reasons why I think Christianity still makes sense despite the best objections of many skeptics and atheists. And so uh, in the first half of the book, I lay out a few reasons why I think God is the best explanation for a number of factors of life. And what I'm going to try to do in just the remainder of our time before we go to some Q&A uh, at the end is to, to lay out a few of those. Um, the way I put it in the book is that um, I think we should, uh, when, we, when, when we're trying to make the case for Christianity to skeptics and doubters, one fruitful way of approaching that is to talk about God as the best explanation. Now, why would I use that particular phraseology? Well, what I've often found is that when, uh, uh, often an atheist, um, when they come on the show, they, they may be assuming that theirs is the default natural position, if you like, and that uh, any Christian who comes on, well, they're obviously going to have to provide a great deal of evidence to support their strange beliefs in the supernatural and God, because the atheist is over here, and they're just the normal person who, you know, just sees the universe as it is, doesn't think there's anything supernatural about it, certainly no God, so please do bring on your evidence for your Christian faith. But I think that's a slightly misconceived way of, of looking at things, because the fact is, whether we're an atheist or a Christian, uh, we both have a worldview of some sort, a way of interpreting the world around us. And both of them need defending, actually. And in the case of atheism, most of the atheists I meet subscribe to some form of what I would call naturalism or materialism. Yes, certainly it involves the, fact, the belief that there's no God, but that itself has all kinds of consequences. Uh, it does involve a certain set of metaphysical assumptions about the world we live in, ultimately. So naturalism believes that, ultimately, that all that exists is matter in motion. Uh, electrons, protons, the physical forces that govern our universe. If you boil it all down, that's all that ultimately exists. And that, of course, has some consequences for it, because it means that all of the emotions and morality and purpose and beauty that, we, that makes life worth living, frankly, are ultimately illusions that we've projected onto what is ultimately a material world. That None of these things exist intrinsically in the universe. They are simply a very interesting byproduct, if you like, of purely material processes. And of course there are metaphys metaphysical assumptions about where the universe came from and where it's going. The, where the universe came from, well that's something of a mystery. Certainly not one that they believe points to God, but there's certainly no purpose, no overall meta-narrative to life or the universe, and it's not particularly going anywhere. And so there's a number of actually quite deep assumptions, metaphysical assumptions about the nature of life, if you are a thoroughgoing atheist, in my opinion. I think, rather than it being just something where, oh, it's simply that I don't believe in God, I think if you actually trace the logical conclusions of a thoroughgoing atheist position, there's actually quite a lot that it commits you to. And so while the Christian may certainly have a certain amount of evidence that they need to bring to bear for their beliefs in God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and uh, the fact that they believe we are created and meant to be here and, and put here for a purpose and so on. Equally, the atheist has a certain amount of, um, of a burden of proof to bear themselves because they are also bringing a lot of assumptions to their view of life and the universe, this naturalism, which also needs defending. So it's not that one is, is just a natural position to take and the other is the one that needs all the evidence. It's that both are positions where we're making truth claims about the way life is and both need defending. And so, very often on the show, it's not just that the Christian is being called on to defend their beliefs, but the atheist is also being called on by the Christian to justify and defend their way of looking at the world as well. And so, when I say God is the best explanation, I'm, I'm asking, when we look at 
life, the universe and everything, which is the best explanation for it? Is it the materialist, naturalist worldview of an atheist? Or is it the Christian worldview? And for me, I've found in various ways that the Christian worldview is a very satisfactory, very compelling explanation for a number of the things we see around us. The first one I want to look at is, and like any good preacher, I've got three points here. Um, The first thing is that I think God makes sense of human existence. On Facebook, you can add your religious status to your profile. And I remember seeing an atheist friend of mine who'd written in the box for religion, I can hardly believe that I exist. Um, And it's a funny line, because I think what he was saying is, don't ask me to believe in anything supernatural. I can hardly believe that I'm here in the first place. And, uh, And in a way, he's absolutely right, because... The existence of you and me is incredibly unlikely in the big scheme of things. You see, there is a familiar and popular uh, myth that we don't need God now that we have science. But if anything, I think the direction of travel has been in the opposite direction, as in the last 70 years or so, science has revealed the extraordinary complexity and origins of our universe, and just what it took to get us here in the first place. And one of the various factors in that is something called the fine-tuning of the universe. Some of you uh, who are interested in uh, science and cosmology may be familiar with this idea, but I'm going to try and give you a a quick crash course in it. This was a fascinating thing that opened up for me when I began having scientists on both sides of the religious divide join me on Unbelievable. And one of the very earliest shows we did was on this question of the so-called fine-tuning of the universe. Uh, Physicists agree that when the universe came into existence, and that itself is a remarkable fact worth thinking about, but when the universe came into existence, the fundamental laws and physical constants that it was birthed with and which govern it were fine-tuned in an astonishingly accurate way to allow for life to develop at some point in the history of the universe. Now, it's a big idea, and it's one that I've tried myself to encapsulate in a video that I produced about a year and a half ago. So I'm going to show the video and, uh, and then we'll talk about it after we've shown it. So that was a, a video um, called How a Dice Can Show That God Exists. And uh, it's online if you want to look it up. But it is an extraordinary factor of our universe, this extraordinary fine-tuning. And the fine-tuning is undisputed in a sense among the scientists, the question is, is God responsible for it? And that's the kinds of questions that we debate on the show, of course. Uh, This was the way that Fred Hoyle put it, who was a well-known physicist of his generation. When these extraordinary factors of the universe started to be discovered, he said, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics, as well as chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. So I think that there is an extraordinary story to be told of the fact that rather than closing down the God question, science in many respects has been opening it up. And I think actually the fine-tuning of the universe is just one of a number of different ways in which science, especially cosmology, has been opening up that big question about where did this all come from? Is there a reason behind it? Are we just a fluke of the universe? Because, as I say, on atheism, it has to be that we are just an accidental byproduct of the universe. But it's very hard to see how that's possible when we look at the fine-tuning of the universe. Chance just seems to be ruled out by these astronomically large numbers we're talking about. And so we have to, I think, open ourselves up to the idea that actually maybe this was intended. Maybe there is something going on here. The universe saw us coming in some way. And for me, that's far more consistent with a Christian worldview than with an atheist worldview. So this is somewhere where I might begin in a conversation with someone who's sceptical of the idea that Christianity makes sense, is to say, well, I think human existence actually makes sense in the light of Christianity, far more so than in the light of atheism. Here's another reason I would give. I think that God makes sense of human value. Now, for this one, I think we, rather than looking outside ourselves into the universe that we're part of, I think we look within ourselves and ask questions about how we view humanity. 
There's a story I want to read you. In 1973, a wealthy businessman, James Jaramillo, was walking along the streets of Bogota in Colombia when he saw a young girl climbing down through a manhole into the sewers below. So James went home, put on a wetsuit, and followed the girl into the manhole. And to his amazement, he discovered about 90 children living in these filthy rat-infested sewers under the streets. And the reason they were living there was that off-duty policemen were actually killing the children who lived on the pavements above the sewers. One officer said, killing these kids is like killing lice. We call them the disposables. And since then, James has rescued hundreds of these young children and used his money to build a special home where they receive an education and live in a loving Christian community. And I'm sure, like me, you find that story both disturbing and inspiring because we react with horror at the idea that human beings could be treated in such a way as disposables. But then I think we have to ask ourselves why. Why do we believe that human life should be valued? Why did James do the right thing, the human thing? The fact is, again, on atheism, I've always struggled to come up with an answer to that question, because on atheism, there is actually ultimately no value to human life in and of itself. Humans have no more claim on the, for special regard on the biological tree of life than any other life form. And if one culture does develop a disregard for human life, if one culture develops uh, a way of treating street children in that way, well, that's just the way the world is. There's nothing intrinsically special about us. And one of the stories I tell in the book is when I did get my very first interview with Richard Dawkins. I'd been wanting to have him on the show for a long time, but the opportunity had never materialised. And eventually I got my opportunity when he was in debate with a well-known Christian thinker called John Lennox at Oxford University. And after the, the debate, which was held in these grand surroundings of Oxford's Natural History Museum, there was an after-show get-together party and I managed to finally bag this interview with Richard Dawkins. I went up to him with my microphone, and I got about 10 minutes with the the world's most famous atheist. Um, I sort of had a mini-debate of my own with him, which I I had later on the programme. And one of the most interesting moments in our conversation was when we got onto the subject of human morality, and whether you can ground this belief in human dignity and value and morality without God. And he ended up making what I thought was quite an interesting admission. And I'm just going to read you verbatim how our conversation went. So I asked Dawkins, but if we'd evolved into a society where rape was considered fine, would that mean that rape is fine? And he replied, well, I don't want to answer that question. It's enough for me to say that we live in a society where it's not considered fine. We live in a society where selfishness, Failure to pay your debts, failure to reciprocate favours is regarded askance. That is the society in which we live. I'm very glad. That's a value judgment. Glad that I live in such a society. And I responded, but when you make a value judgment like that, don't you yourself immediately step outside of this evolutionary process and say, well, the reason that's good is that it's good. And you don't have any way to stand on that statement. And he replied, well, my value judgment itself could come from my evolutionary past. And I responded, well, therefore, it's just as random, in a sense, as any product of evolution. And he said, yes, you could say that. In any case, nothing about it makes it more probable that there's anything supernatural. And I finished by saying, okay, but ultimately, your belief that rape is wrong is as arbitrary as the fact that we've evolved five fingers rather than six. And he said, you could say that, yes. And you could say that, and I think you should say that if you're a thoroughgoing atheist like Richard Dawkins. I think he was being perfectly consistent with his worldview. But most of us, and that includes atheists, instinctively recoil at the idea that our moral belief that rape is wrong is just the happenstance of the hand that evolution happens to have dealt us. So why then do we believe that rape really is wrong? Why is it wrong for off-duty police officers to kill defenceless children? Why is that really wrong, not just the way the world happens to have worked out? See, I believe that our belief in the reality of human value and dignity and morality is understandable in the light of Christianity, and it's very hard to explain on an atheistic worldview. Because 
as Christians, we believe that we have imprinted on us the design of our maker, right from the get-go in Genesis. We're told that humanity is made in the image of God. That gives us inestimable value and worth. And in fact, anything else actually makes human worth a commodity and makes some people inevitably disposable. One of these children in Bogota that was found gunned down had a note pinned to them, and it said, I killed you because you had no education and no future. And the question for us is, is that the measure of a human life? Is it dependent on who we are and where we're born, our education, our class status? Or is it dependent on something that is immovable, that will never change? Is it dependent on a transcendent God who says, you're valued and made in my image? And I believe it's only the God who says that we're made in his image that makes sense of this deep sense we have of the intrinsic value of humanity. So there's another reason why I think Christianity makes more sense of our belief in human value than atheism does. And the final one I wanted to bring today, God makes sense of human purpose. Um, There's a a woman called Jennifer Fulweiler, and I tell her story in the book as well. Now, Jennifer uh, was brought up in a loving family, but one in which religion was painted clearly as false. She says that she never remembers a time when she believed in God. She was raised on a diet of science, reason, and evidence-based rational thought. Her bedtime reading was Carl Sagan's book, Cosmos, apparently. And from a young age, she knew that the world ran according to this well-established set of scientific principles. Natural laws, molecules, electrons, matter, protons. That was what life consisted of. There was certainly no need for God. And Jennifer remained a happy atheist into the early years of her married life. However, it was shortly after the birth of her first child that Jennifer experienced a dramatic shift in her thinking. And this is the way she describes it. She says, I looked down and thought, what is this baby? And I thought, well, from a pure atheist materialist perspective, he is a randomly evolved collection of chemical reactions. And I realized if that's true, then all the love that I feel for him is actually nothing more than chemical reactions in my brain. And I looked down at him and I thought, that's not true. It's not the truth. And that moment was a turning point for Jennifer and set her off on a journey which ultimately led her to Jesus. And I think what Jennifer realized in that moment was that the story atheism tells is a very different one to the story that Christianity tells. And Dawkins has again very neatly summarized this for us. He uh, he wrote once, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And I think he's absolutely right. If there is no God, then if atheism is true, as Jennifer herself put it, we are a randomly evolved collection of chemical reactions. If atheism is true, then in a sense, all human endeavor, all self-made human purposes will actually one day be swallowed up when the universe eventually runs out of energy. It'll all just be blind, pitiless indifference in the end. That's the universe that Dawkins sees. But I see a very different universe to Dawkins, because where he only sees physical processes governed by physical laws, I see beauty and truth and love and real right and wrong and purpose and hope. And these aren't things you can actually measure using the scientific instruments that Dawkins relies on to understand the universe. They're great. They have their place. Of course they do. They're not the only way we understand the universe. They're not the only way we understand life. It's a whole other set of tools we use to understand what makes life meaningful. And for me, this is where I think the story of atheism and Christianity part company. And in a sense, why do I believe that only God really explains human purpose. It's because actually I think we see purpose all around us. We see it across all times, places and cultures, this yearning for transcendence, for life to be more than just the 70 odd years that we're given on earth. Um, C.S. Lewis said this, he said, a baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. 
A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. People feel sexual desire. Well, there is such a thing as sex. And he concluded by saying this. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. It's sometimes called the argument from desire. And it's worth asking ourselves, could this desire for the transcendent, which we see in every culture, time and place, could it have a real object which satisfies it? In the way that all our other physical desires do have an object which meets it. Because we all long for this purpose, a purpose that outlives the short span of our years. In Ecclesiastes, the writer put it like this, you've set eternity in our hearts. And the famous uh, mathematician and Christian philosopher Blaise Pascal put it this way, there's a God-shaped hole in the heart of every person, and it can never be filled by any created thing. It can only be filled by God made known through Jesus Christ. So ultimately, I do believe that atheism and Christianity tell two very different stories. One is, if you boil it down to its logical conclusions, one of ultimate purposelessness. And the other is of ultimate hope. Hope that there is a reason for our existence, hope that life really does mean something, and hope that death is not the end. And I believe that only Christianity answers the deepest longings of our souls. Jesus' death is the ultimate expression of love in this universe, forgiving us and making us right with God again. And Jesus' resurrection is the ultimate expression of hope that we could hope for. And the case for all of that is our other chapters in the book, really, uh, that I'd encourage you to go and have a look at. But I think what it gives us is an answer to this longing, to this, this idea that humans have always been looking for purpose and meaning in life. Christianity gives that in spades. It's a hope that goes beyond the grave, hope that our lives in this world will one day be set right as well. And I've met many atheists in my time of hosting The Unbelievable Show, and they're almost invariably intelligent, honest, good people. And the worst kind of apologetics we can do is sort of dismissing or, uh, or, or insulting people. And I hope that anything I've said tonight won't make you in any way look down on an atheist in their honest search for truth. But we do see the world in very different ways. And so when I critique... I'm critiquing atheism rather than the atheists who hold it. Because I find it very hard to believe that the rational and ordered universe we live in came from nowhere and is heading nowhere. I find it almost impossible to conceive that our intrinsic beliefs about human value are merely an illusion foisted on us by purely material processes. Nor can I convince myself that our search for meaning and purpose are ultimately in vain. To me, it makes far more sense to read God's fingerprints and purposes both out there in the universe and within us. I'll just finish with a quick story because a lot of this stuff is is great. It may be helpful in starting a conversation with someone who's sceptical about faith. It may be a useful way in. But ultimately, if all we're giving people are arguments and evidences, then we've actually fallen short of our job as Christians. We're called to invite people into a living faith, something that really makes a difference, something that is ultimately experienced and not just thought about in our head. And I once had the evangelist Michael Green speak at uh, one of my conferences. We do an annual unbelievable conference each year. The next one's coming up in May. But he, he once spoke and he told a story I've always remembered. And it was a story about a woman who found Christianity quite compelling, but had a lot of questions and doubts about it. And a friend of hers took her to an old church and showed her the building. And from the outside, it looked very austere and foreboding, with these tall windows that were dark and opaque. But when she had approached the front door and stepped inside into the sanctuary, the same way we're sitting here, the light streamed in through the stained glass windows and bathed the whole thing in glorious colour. And the church was a very different experience stepping into it than it was looking outside. And I think it's really important for many people to do that process of investigating the evidence from the outside, prodding and poking and asking those questions. But if that's where we stay, we'll never really understand Christianity, in my view. So there's always going to be that point where you take that step of faith and you step inside. Because ultimately, experiencing something is often the only way we truly understand it. 
And that's the invitation, of course, of Christianity, is to step inside this experience and taste what it's like from the inside. That's our call as apologists, as evangelists, as Christians, to live out this faith and to show what Christianity looks like in practice, and when asked, to give a reason for the hope that is within us. So thank you very much for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.